Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the great pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I'm good, Brian. Here we are. It's Breeders' Cup time. The pre-entries are in, and boy, are they there an awful lot of them for handicappers to wade through. Absolutely, Matt. Over 200 horses were entered in the 14 Breeders' Cup races next Friday and Saturday at Keeneland, Matt. I don't know about you. We've been doing the show a long time, uh, ever since 1984, though, long before we started the show. Uh, I've been just a kid on Christmas morning when the, uh, the, the, the past performances come out for all these wonderful Breeders' Cup horses. Here we are again. It never gets old. Without further ado, Matt, let's talk about the horses that we think are the most noteworthy, the most interesting, the top names running in the Breeders' Cup. Now, shame on us. We we don't have horses like the Kentucky Derby winner, Rich Strike, uh, Golden Powell going for a third Breeders' Cup, Latruska, the champion, trying a different Breeders' Cup this race, uh, this year. Uh, Moira, the interesting uh, Canadian three-year-old filly, so many horses, but we just submitted our list and we, uh, we put them together. We came up with 15 folks. We're going to start with the classic. Matt, I'll let you talk about the top horse here, flight line first. Hey, Brian, uh, it's, a, you know, it's an interesting classic uh, with flight line. And I, you know, before the show, I was thinking, is, has there been a more anticipated favorite in the classic in recent years than flight line and then i said i i don't know you know and i went back and if you go back and look at the names of the of recent winners of of the classic there's some pretty amazing horses that have come out authentic uh, accelerate gun runner vino rosso it, it it's quite an all-star list and and as formidable as flight line seems in the classic this year, when you put put that up against some of these past winners, you know, it, it makes you think, uh, you know, okay, flight line is something else, but these other hor horses that have won recently have been pretty darn good too. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. And, and the horse that comes to mind with what you were talking about is American Pharaoh, who won the first Breeders' Cup Classic ever held at Keeneland several years ago. But yeah, Flightline is a little different. Uh, you know, American Pharaoh was a Triple Crown winner, but Flightline is a little different. He's been so good in his first five races of his career, every single one of those first five races of his career, from his maiden win to his 19 length. Uh, tour de force in the 10 furlong Pacific Classic this summer at Del Mar. Uh, he, he has looked like a special, special horse. This will be his toughest test yet. This is at Keeneland, a new track for him, 10 furlongs against his strongest field he's ever faced. But I am of the belief, Matt, that Flightline is a special horse. And it, it might sound crazy. It might sound slightly sacrilegious to say this, but I don't know if there's been a better American horse in the Breeders' Cup since its inception back in 1984. That's how special I think flight line could be. That statement could look pretty silly if he gets beat here in the Breeders' Cup Classic uh, on Saturday, November 5. But uh, flight line is a monster. It's just so good. The sun atop it, the way he works out, the way he moves over the track, the, what, the way he can take the race right from the start or or come from just off the lead uh looks like a different realm of horse to me anyway the next horse on the list matt it, we look at this record of life is uh life is good the son of into mischief now trained by todd pletcher originally trained by bob baffert nine wins and 11 starts and i tell you what it, even his losses aren't bad i guess i guess the one that you could point to as a disappointment was the dubai world cup but i don't know you're going to have to talk him on to me you're you're a pletcher guy you like pletcher generally i just am not on life is good he's not going to be on my tickets in the breeders cup classic but he has to be on this list he might be the second best american horse I, you know, I think by record, Brian, I think there is no question about that. And uh, 
in the NTRA poll. It has been consistent. He has been the second ranked horse behind Flightline for uh, most of the year. But yes, I think your sentiment is a sentiment that a lot of people seem to have, especially after, you know, his last race, which was on a sloppy track and was a little bit lackluster compared to some of his uh, very impressive victories um, in, in other races this year. But I don't know, Brian, how much is life is good going to be overlooked in the betting in the classic? Yeah, I, I guess that's an interesting question. Who's the second choice in the classic? And on paper, it should be life is good. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit, though, Matt. I, I just haven't liked life is good as much since the Pegasus World Cup. Uh, the Dubai World Cup, obviously, he's only tried 10 furlongs. He tired late. He did not look good in the final furlong of that 10 furlong race on a tiring track at Maidan earlier this year. But since that trip, I have not been overwhelmed by what we've seen from Life is Good. I know he's three for three since then, and, and maybe I'm nitpicking a little bit. The other thing, of course, is the speed of flight line. Life is Good uh, it, it is a speed horse, and with flight line on him or hounding him, that that makes me worry even more about the 10 furlongs for a very, very good horse in Life is Good. We have three-year-olds on this list, Matt, and I think the three-year-old champion this year should be Epicenter unless something unusual happens at the Breeders' Cup, and that's certainly possible. But um, I think Epicenter's been the best three-year-old this year. Seven starts. He's won four. He's been third and – I'm sorry, second in the other three. The son of not this time, trained by Steve Asmussen. I think it's been terrific, even though he didn't win one of those Triple Crown races. Uh, but uh, never better in those two races at Saratoga, the Jim Dandy and the Travers. A, a, a big shot for a horse, I think, is – very close to clinching an Eclipse Award. Yeah, I think so. Very close. Um, Steve Asmussen has eight past winners in the Breeders' Cup over the years. Um, he, he's handled the epicenter, uh, you know, as he does with most, with a, with a good bit of racing. Although, you know, he's had a little bit of a break here in training up to the, uh, to the Breeders' Cup since that impressive victory in the Travers, um, yeah, but he's not the only three-year-old to give consideration to in this field. And I do want to say that three-year-olds have done well in the Classic. Yeah, three-year-olds have had some uh, some history in the Classic, and Epicenter certainly looks to be getting better, kind of like uh, Asmussen's champion of a few years ago, Gunrunner. Uh, Epicenter is uh, a horse who... You certainly can't worry about with 10 furlongs as well. He'll be behind the top two here early, and uh, Epicenter might be the horse who's most likely to run second to flight line, in, in my estimation. Then you got Taba, Matt, a son of Gunrunner. I just mentioned Gunrunner. Bob Baffert, look at that lifetime record. Uh, you know, flight line is, is strange. Flight line is, 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 is an outlier in that he's a four-year-old with only five starts and they've just been so good. But Taba, here comes Taba with only five lifetime starts into the Breeders' Cup Classic. That's unusual to only have five lifetime starts. And two of the horses on our list only have five lifetime starts coming into the Breeders' Cup Classic. But Taba is the one who might be moving forward, who might be getting better. Uh, you know, he was a grade one winner in his second career start. He's been, a, he's, he's running nothing but grade one races since winning a maiden sprint. And he's done pretty darn well in why not Taba in the Breeders' Cup Classic? I don't know, Brian. Why not? And, you know, you mentioned that uh, it's a little unusual, the only five starts for T for Taba, but it has been an unusual year for Bob Baffert, certainly. But if I'm not mistaken, Brian, uh, Bob Baffert has won the Breeders' Cup Classic four times, and I think each of those times it has been with a three-year-old. And some noteworthy three-year-olds. We, we mentioned them a little bit uh, earlier. He won three classics in a row with three-year-olds, with, uh, with Arrogate, with American Pharaoh, with Bayern, throw Authentic in there most recently. All three-year-olds. Yeah, Taba, Taba is, a, is a wild card. Maybe he'll be the second choice. I don't know. I, 
you know, you, you mentioned life is good, you know, uh, people being like me with their feelings about life is good uh, as uh, as not a huge threat to flight line in here. Maybe maybe table will get bad, but uh, certainly that Pennsylvania Derby last time was his best effort yet. He beat a good field. He did it looking good. Just have the feeling table could be the one getting better and better with each start. Man. All right. So. We, we talked about the classic courses. We're going to go to probably the second most uh, uh, anticipated race on the Breeders' Cup card. I, I think we have more than one race on these graphics here, but we got to start talking about the distaff. We only have two of our most noteworthy horses coming from the distaff, but we could have easily stretched this out to, to, to a few more in the distaff. It's an interesting race. And of course, it starts with the Pletcher pair of Daughters of Curlin. One's a champion, one will soon be. I've always been on the Nest bandwagon. I seem, I seem to uh, see a lot of people saying she's too slow, and I, I just don't get it. Watching the races uh, is much more important to me than a, than a number, a speed figure number. I think Nest has been very, very good all year, and she's only getting better. Big win earlier this year uh, at, at uh, Keeneland. I think the three-year-old filly deserves to be the favorite in the distance. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's a terrific matchup. Just look at that graphic uh, you already mentioned. Look at the similarities, Brian. You already mentioned that they're both by Curlin, but then take a look at their records there. Um, all their finishes in the top three, mostly all wins, one-third. So many similarities there. Uh, Todd Pletcher has uh, 12 career wins in the Breeders' Cup. Two of them coming in the distaff. I ask you, my friend, could we be looking at a race that has as exciting a finish as happened a few years ago back in 2016, I think, when Songbird, as a three-year-old, ran against the older mare Beholder? Yeah, that certainly crossed my mind, Matt. We were, we were there at Santa Anita for that one, and that was a memorable uh, Breeders' Cup race, to say the least, one of the most memorable in the last decade. And, uh, yeah, perhaps we are in store for something special in here. Malathot, uh, just like Nest in so many ways, uh, has also never run a bad race, just like Nest. I, I think Nest would be better suited for 10 furlongs than 9 furlongs, and and possibly that's true about Malathot too. I said Nest won her only start at uh, Keeneland for fun in, in the Grade One Ashland earlier this year. Malathot's actually three for three at Keeneland, although the first two were relatively hard earned before romping last time with a win over the track in the Spinster. Uh, I've seen some people say that maybe Malathot could be the favorite here. I think it's going to be Nest, but Malathot certainly a strong second choice coming off two straight graded stakes wins. Yeah, I think it's going to be Nest also. I think that uh, that impressive second place finish in the Belmont Stakes against the boys that kind of launched Nest uh, on her wonderful streak that she's been on and launched her even more into the uh, the public eye of, of handicappers and horse racing fans. So I, I think that alone will make Nest the favorite. Won't be by much. The two are certainly going to be uh, dominate the wagering. Dominate the wagering, and then we're totally forgetting about what Steve Asmussen has in the uh, in the Breeders' Cup distaff, and they're not on our list. But we need to mention the raw speed, the talent, the coming up talent of society, and then Clarier, the older filly, the older uh, uh, daughter of Curlin, another Curlin man. <laughs> Clarier's beaten Malathot two out of three this year. So, uh, yeah, our, our list here is Pletcher dominant, but don't forget about Steve Asmussen in the distaff. The next big one, Matt, on the list is the Tur. Finally, we get our first European to make this list, Matt, and, the, and this list is probably American-centric, being that both Matt and I are American. But anyway, uh, I think the race favorite will be Rebels Romance. Rebels Romance is coming over to the Breeders' Cup turf. It's actually his second trip to America, Matt. I, I considered him as a interesting horse last year for the Belmont Stakes when he came over, but uh, a, a, a hind leg infection knocked him out of consideration for the Belmont after already being 
out the track in New York, and uh, he didn't race for a long time. When he did come back, his dirt races were not good early this year, but uh, since switching back to the turf, he has been absolutely terrific for the familiar connections of Charlie Appleby and Bo Dolphin. Yes, Charlie Appleby. I mean, who in my eyes has taken the mantle as the uh, European trainer to most worry about in Breeders' Cup races, and, and even for that matter, uh, bringing horses from Europe over to the big races in North America. Charlie Appleby has very, very quickly piled up six Breeders' Cup wins, and Brian very impressively did it from only 11 starters. Yeah, Rebels Romance is coming off two Group 1 wins in Germany. You might look at that uh, country where he's ran recently and think, okay, that's a little bit lesser, but uh, I've always liked that German form. Good uh, 12 furlong races in Germany are very good, and, and I wouldn't worry about those races happening in Germany. Rebels Romance is the real deal. I think he'll buy for favoritism with his stablemate, another Appleby Godolphin runner, because Nation's Pride has been terrific, a three-year-old, when he's come over to America a few times already. But the other one on our most noteworthy horses list of the Breeders' Cup, Matt, is Warlike Goddess. Boy, look at the record. Look at the record of all four. We have the Distaff horses still up. We have the Turf horses. These are some seriously nice and consistent horses. Warlike Goddess certainly fills the bill as she takes on males. I wrote a while ago that I think she should point for the male race because she is truly a 12 furlong horse, and the mile 3 sixteenths of the Philly and Mare Distaff does not suit her nearly as well. Warlike Goddess undefeated at Keeneland, undefeated at 12 furlongs, coming off a big win against the boys. Euros have the advantage here, but uh, we have a pretty good American in this in this uh, uh, daughter of the English Channel. Yeah, and I and you're absolutely right, Brian. Uh, you know, after that last victory, Bill Mott uh, said that he was going to go to the turf, and and it wasn't about another matchup against the boys or anything like that. It was strictly, as you pointed out, that he wanted more like Goddess in the longer race that was offered. He didn't want her going uh, at a mile and three sixteenths. And I agree, Brian, when I was making these graphics for the show, I just was kind of overwhelmed with the record of these horses that we put up. And we weren't, you know, we weren't looking to put up the horses that, you know, had the best records uh, uh, that we could find. But, yeah, you, you look at them and, and it's not just on this uh, graphic that's up. It, it, it's on all these horses we're going to talk about. Just tremendous, tremendous record. Uh, Warlike Goddess by English Channel. Uh, you know, uh, um, certainly a tough ask going against uh, those Applebee horses, but she's been awfully good. Yeah, and, and coming off a very nice performance uh, in the Turf Classic last time against the males. All right, Matt, we're moving on. This is fun. Most noteworthy names in the Breeders' Cup. Top horses. Sorry, fans. Golden Pal, Rich Strike, Latruska, Moira. Uh, I already said that, but uh, there's so many good horses here. Let's just see who we have next. We're going to the Breeders' Cup mile. There's that name again. Charlie Appleby, Go Dolphin, Son of Dubawi, Modern Games. Uh, uh, six of tw Only six of 12. What's wrong with this horse? He's only one half of his lifetime starts. Of course, he's been running in big races over in Europe, but most importantly, Matt, when he's come over to North America twice now, Modern Games has been awesome. He has been awesome. Back to that controversial uh, running of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf last year where Modern Games just overwhelmed that field, and then he came over for the Woodbine Mile uh, not too long ago, and once again overwhelmed the field, and yes, was second in his last start, but boy, that was just a monstrous field that uh, he ran in at Haskett. I guess you can you know, if you want to poke holes in modern games, I guess maybe you can say, well, he's doing it on three weeks uh, notice back and forth across the pond uh, for these races. Yeah, okay, I get that. But Charlie Appleby, uh, 
seems to pick the horses he wants to send and only sends the ones that are going to run well. Yeah, when's the last time a Charlie Appleby horse came over and didn't run well? I, I can't remember Matt in modern games ha has done it before. Uh, he's had some tough races over in Europe. He's been running against the best. And, of course, turf racing in Europe is better than American turf racing in general. Uh, modern games uh, has looked so good uh, in, in those uh, races. Uh, most recently, the Wood by Mile when he's come over. He's a Group 1 winner in France as well. Matt, hey, I like to stump you every once in a while. You hate it. I like it. But I'm going to try to stump you, Matt. There's one horse in the Breeders' Cup pre-entries, only one. And he happens to be on our list of horses here whose last race was at beautiful Arlington Park th that we miss so much. Who's that one horse, man? I think we're talking about domestic spending. Uh, See, um, I, I knew I didn't stump you. Domestic spending. Who would have thought he'd be on our list of top names for the 2022 Breeders' Cup uh, uh, just a short time ago? But here he is, Matt. And I think it's been about 15 months since his last race. Yeah, I think so. And boy, did he have a absolutely fantastic uh, campaign in 2021 and obviously uh, ran into some problems. And, and I don't know, you know, at what point Chad Brown decided that domestic spending was going to come to the Breeders' Cup. I know it wasn't that long ago, but by all reports, domestic spending is training as well as he as he ever has in his career in his career prompting chad to give domestic spending a shot in this breeders cup mile yeah it, it's it's kind of an amazing story and this will be a training test for chad brown and he's passed this test before maybe not quite like this but in similar situations just not the breeders cup as your first race back in a long, after a long, long run. The men, this domestic spending has the uh, turn of foot of a top European runner. He he was that good. I know he lost the last one in the Arlington Million. I guess they called it the Mr. D last year, but uh, slow paced and, and he came running late even there. He, he just doesn't run a bad race. He's an awesome turf horse, awesome turn of foot. Training and running are two different things. Uh, De Haas was uh, was a horse who, you know, people raved about the training job of Michael uh, Dickinson did years ago. And De Haas was another special horse. Uh, but De Haas uh, had at least one prep race after a huge layoff, even longer than domestic spending's layoff. Who knows? Um, I certainly can't discount domestic spending. He's probably been the best turf horse in America the last couple of years, although he hasn't run this year. All right, Matt, uh, look, look at these two next on our list because uh, this is going to be, uh, the, talk about the jack of all trades, a, a, a meeting of jacks, uh, Jack Christopher, Jackie's warrior. You were right, Jack Christopher is in the sprint. I think that's kind of a good thing because that's where he's going to win an Eclipse Award if he can win the sprint. Jack Christopher, son of money, is a three-year-old by Chad Brown. Big wins in grade one races, both at two and three. His only loss was not bad when he got tired late in the nine for a long half goal against the likes of Cyberknife and Taba. Jack Christopher is a really, really good horse and an interesting choice going here in the six for a long sprint. Oh, yeah, Brian. I, and you were right. I said it before. I was hoping that. Uh, Jack Christopher would go in the sprint uh, because I thought that that was the best spot for Jack Christopher as opposed to the two-turn uh, uh, mile of the dirt mile this year at Keeneland. Um, what a matchup. And we talked about those records of horses and, and, and two horses with fantastic records. Uh, Jackie's Warrior, you, Rarely loses, but one of those losses came last year in the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Came last year in the Breeders' Cup Sprint, Matt, although I'm expecting a different kind of pace setup here. It, it really doesn't look like the six furlong sprint has a whole lot of speed, and I think that helps Jackie's Warrior, who has been America's top sprinter the last few years. Uh, look at that record as well. You throw out the Breeders' Cup failures in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile two years ago in the Breeders' Cup Sprint last year, and that record becomes 
really, really good. He was run down at seven furlongs last time, though, by uh, Cody Swish in the seven furlong four to go at Saratoga. So Jackie's Warrior still has that vulnerability about him, but all of a sudden, I think he's got a Breeders' Cup race to finally set up for him well because he is the speed of this field, and it might be up to Jack Christopher uh, to, uh, to to try to stay close early and to, to pounce and make a move on Jackie's Warrior. I think that's what's going to happen in the sprint. It's just a matter of how early Jack Christopher is going to go after Jackie's Warrior. Could that set it up for something somebody else to come from off the pace? It's possible. Or could that set up a really interesting length of the stretch battle between probably our two best sprinters in the country? Getting back to Jack Christopher, Matt, I think he would have been the horse to beat in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. I think he's the horse to beat in the Breeders' Cup Sprint, though. Uh, that's how good a three-year-old he is. But Jackie's Warrior, with this pace setup, look out. Yeah, we'll, it, we'll certainly find out just how good is Jack Christopher. I think we already know how good Jackie's warrior is. Maybe, but maybe not, because he's 0 for 2 in the Breeders' Cup. He wasn't that close to winning either Breeders' Cup. I think Jack Jackie's warrior almost needs to win this race to put his name in, in, in among the greatest sprinters uh, of, uh, of this century so far. Jackie's warrior 0 for 3 on the Breeders' Cup resume would just not look as good for such a good horse. All right, Matt, we're rolling right along here. Let's get to our final page. We're going to jump around a little bit. The Dirt Mile, Cyber Knight. Why is he on this list, Matt? He's lost his last two races. Taba handled him last time in the Pennsylvania Derby. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And and he lost to uh, Epicenter in the Travers before that. Um, you know, But Cyber Knight has had a heck of a year this year in the three-year-old division. Big win in the Haskell, um, and I, I think Cyberknife is an example of the reason why the Dirt Mile has a place in the Breeders' Cup. Well, yeah, I guess it might have been nice to have Cyberknife's name on the list of entries in the Classic. It would have made the field a little bit bigger, but... I think it gives the ownership group of Cyberknife and the trainer, Brad Cox, a, a really good option to make that race exciting and to give Cyberknife a better chance to uh, be competitive. Yeah, there's a three-year-old males this year. There's no horse with more than two grade one wins. And Cyberknife is one of those horses. Of course, the Arkansas Derby and the Haskell. The Haskell was a great win over Taba and Jack Christopher. Cyberknife is a horse people were talking about for the three-year-old Eclipse Award one race ago. And, and I think he was too far back for whatever reason in the Pennsylvania Derby, never really got a great shot. I, I think this mile, which is more like a mile and 70 yards with this super long run up because of the configuration of the Keeneland track, I think Cyberknife is the horse to beat here going after his third grade one win of the year. And who knows if he wins this, like I think he's got a real shot to do and uh and the older horses just take care of the three-year-olds in the breeders cup classic maybe cyber knife maybe jack christopher have a say in this three-year-old eclipse award so cyber knife deserved a spot on this list as does cave rock matt as does cave rock um flight lines first five races are the best first five races i've probably ever seen and I've been watching horse racing for five decades. Uh, but K-Rock, I tell you, you know, he can't compete with that. But his first three races as a two-year-old out in California, Matt, they're really, really good. Yeah, really, really good. Absolutely, Brian. And with that record and, and Bob Baffert is the trainer, I think that Cave Rock is going to be the second heavy, heavily bet favorite in the two days of the Breeders' Cup, only behind uh, Flightline. Uh, of course, you know, uh, Bob Baffert has a fantastic record in the juvenile. He's won it uh, five times in the past with with horses, um, you know, uh, uh, like Corniche, Midshipment, New Year's Day, Vindication, uh, um, and yeah. Cave Rock uh, has been so impressive and already has uh, two grade one wins. Yeah, he's been 
terrific sprinting, seven furlongs uh, in the Dunmark Futurity, and then two turns last time, a mile and a 16th. Uh, we always want to talk Kentucky Derby. People always want to talk Kentucky Derby. And, and Cave Rock, as good as he's been in those three starts, trained by Baffert, uh, a son of Arrogate. The, the, there's a lot of reason to believe this horse can go a distance. And this will be a test leaving Southern California for a first time. But Cave Rock, certainly to this point, looks like the horse to beat here in the juvenile and certainly looks like an early Kentucky Derby favorite. So he had to be on the list. And finally, Matt, maybe a little bit of sentiment here, but there's a lot of interesting stories surrounding our last horse on the list, Tyler's Tribe, a gelded son of Sharp Azteca, a gelded two-year-old son of Sharp Azteca, a freshman sire, uh, trained by Timothy Martin. Uh, the, the, from the rider to the ownership to, to the, 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 the co-owner's grandson. This is just a good story. Yeah, Brian, that's absolutely true. And another horse with a fantastic record that we've been saying. Theme of the show was noteworthy names. And, you know, I think, and Tyler's tribe is a noteworthy name. He, he's gotten to be a fan favorite. Um, that probably is going to get him being overbet in the juvenile turf sprint, uh, but that's okay. It's going to be his first try on the turf. The the ownership and the trainer said, you know, we don't have a two turn horse here um, to go in the juvenile, the 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 straight juvenile dirt. Um, so their only alternative was the turf sprint, and I give them credit for taking a shot here. They know they've got a fast horse. But first time on the turf, Iowa bred, has only run in Iowa, three wins against state breads, two wins uh, against open company. Uh, um, we'll see. But Tyler's tribe heading into the Breeders' Cup has certainly become a noteworthy name. Right. And, and, and we're very happy to hear that Tyler of Tyler's tribe, again, the grandson of one of the co-owners, uh, is in remission uh, for leukemia, the eight-year-old grandson. So that's good news. Like to see, uh, uh, hey, Kylie Kylie is the leading uh, female jockey in the country this year at only 20 years old and the leading jockey at uh, Prairie Meadows this year. Matt, Tyler Strive is really fast, and that's what you need in a race like the Juvenile Turf Sprint. He's won his five races by nearly 12 lengths, an average of 12 lengths per race, almost 60 lengths in those five wins. He has grade one speed. I think he's got a shot here. And it would be a heck of a nice story to see Tyler's tribe win a Breeders' Cup race. And, and I think a lot of people will be rooting for them, as, uh, as well as Rich Strike. Why didn't we talk about Rich Strike, Matt? I, I guess uh, neither of us think he's a big threat in the Breeders' Cup Classic, but uh, a big story there, too. This was fun. Breeders' Cup next week, of course, we're going to get down to brass, brass tacks with our top picks for all 14 Breeders' Cup races, folks. But before that, let's get a party shot from my good friend, Matt Shipman. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, past performances are out for the 205 pre-entered horses. Uh, a whole bunch of them in some of the races, uh, you know, are not likely to run. So, um you maybe don't have to pay as much attention for them. I think the draw, they're, they're, they're doing something different on uh, on Monday for post positions. They're going to have in Rupp Arena at the University of Kentucky. That'll be interesting to see. But Brian and I will be back next week with more Breeders' Cup coverage. And as always, want to thank everybody for watching the show. Yeah, thanks for everybody watching the show. We appreciate it. We know we pick up a few more viewers this time of year for the Breeders' Cup. And Matt, uh, Matt and I sure do appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation, go ahead and do that now. I want to throw in a few pre-entry thoughts real quick, Matt. Jack Christopher, we're, we're now assuming that Chad Brown will stick with his word and say the Breeders' Cup sprints the race, but he does have still an option for the Breeders' Cup dirt mile. Latruska in the Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Sprint, we heard that news recently, and, and sure enough, she's going there. Uh, she had speed to a very, very interesting race. That could be my favorite betting race, the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. And I was a little surprised that Chad Brown chose to put Regal Glory in the mile, Matt, 
over uh, the speedy in Italian. I thought in Italian might be an even bigger threat against the boys in the mile, but in Italian will stretch out to a mile three sixteenths for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. That was interesting to me. Derby Wars is also interesting to me, Matt. The best contest site out there, thanks to our sponsor, Derby Wars. We'll be back next week with another big show on Horse Center, another big Breeders' Cup show. Enjoy looking through all those past performances, folks. We will see you then.